Hey, what's up? So, I spent about two hours, give or take, recording a video talking about this Exosister list that I think should be relatively competent into the post-Phantom Nightmare format. And I got linked two videos directly after. One of them was from MBT, one of them was from Dimax, both of them were uploaded yesterday. And they're actually kind of relevant to this. Dimax is only incidentally so, but we're going to play a clip from it. And I'll, of course, link both of those videos in the description. So to start off with, MBT made a video that's like kind of about Ash Blossom, but it also addresses some general considerations that we have when deck building. People will just include Ash Blossom because it's what you do. But as I was playtesting for the Phantom Nightmare format like last year, actually I was doing really early prep. One thing that kept coming up, regardless of what deck I was playing, is you Ash Blossom one of the Snake Eye player's cards, and even if that turns off some option or limits them in some way, if they have the extension to go further, this ends up hurting you more in the end because they'll go into Heater, they'll special summon this back, and then they have the capability to potentially go into an access code line with Selene, or they can do something with Promethean Princess. They can bring back the Hita. If you happen to remove the Hita outside of like banishing it or shuffling it back, it searches out another fire card. It's it's a lot, right? And I don't really want to deal with that. Like this card is good in a variety of matchups, so I don't want to cut it out entirely, right? Unless our you know representation for snake eye hits nearly 99 percent or something like that i still would like to have this card in my side deck for if i'm playing against like runic uh you know that's also part of why cosmic is here is just good for various different spells and traps just happens to work on fountain too uh, but yeah, i don't want to have to deal with that particular circumstance in the snake eye match and a lot of Snake Eye lists I've seen recently have been running Dark, so even though I have swapped to DD Crow, they could still potentially bring this back, right? But it does restrict what their inboard can be, and it also restricts the potential extra um, follow-up value that they can get, which is very important in my opinion. Now, DD Crow is also a card that I've seen a lot of people say isn't really that great this format, and I kind of understand where they're coming from. Like, generally speaking, you want your hand traps to proactively do enough, and you're going to have to pair two of them in most cases. And DD Crow, I think, is just kind of difficult to pair with other hand traps and actually have a good payoff. But, big caveat here, you're playing Exosister. So, this card has the added utility of triggering Martha, and it has the extra boon that a number of your cards can actually proactively force situations that make this better. You're going to force your opponent into doing something, you use the DD Crow, and you take something out of rotation, and wow. Uh, we're not running Nib just because Nib is a bit annoying for us, right? If we end up with the Nibiru on our field, we end up having to get rid of it with Azalea or something to be able to activate our Martha. That's a situation we'd like to avoid, so we try to avoid it. Keeping Azalea and Donner because they both can help dealing with getting nibbed, right? But Donner is also here specifically because sometimes you'll deal with a kaiju, need to get rid of the kaiju. Azalea covers pretty much any other circumstance and also helps to remove something on the opponent's board. That's about it. Uh, in terms of the overall deck structure, I did upload a video mid-January talking a bit about Arment and Martha because I think that Arment is undervalued and Martha is misevaluated. The TLDR of that is basically Arment is a card that allows you to more proactively deal with your opponent on their turn. So something that you could do very early on in their turn is activate the Arment. The Arment also does count as an Xyz summon, so it gives you the capability to use Returnia in a more modular way, right? You can use the Returnia to banish two cards to keep your opponent off of options or force them into different difficult routes, or you could use it to banish something and overlay maybe going into a uh, Xyz monster off your Vodis, potentially going into Magnifica specifically, right? That card in conjunction, well, these cards in conjunction with each other also allow you to potentially just not have to deal with Nibiru. You can stop on four summons if you can get access to both of these. And then on the opponent's turn, you know, you get to lock them out of 
activating effects in the graveyard. So this would be something that's really good against Goblin Rider, for example. And this also stops special summons, which can work in that circumstance as well. It just really depends. You need to kind of know your matchups and know like which one of these is more effective in a given circumstance. This is also really nice because it bounces cards. Having non-destruction removal in this format is really, really good. This deck is all non-destruction removal, but hey, not every deck has that benefit. Um, what else? What else? What else? What else? Oh, let's talk about Sakitama and Aratama. So Aratama is a really nice card, and I think when we have formats that are a little more like mixed in terms of the interaction that you're running, you're running a combination of hand trap or breakers or primarily breakers, this becomes a much better card because the likelihood of it getting negated specifically, like by an effect veiler or infinite impermanence, becomes much lower. Because if this card gets negated, you end up in a situation where you're like, damn, I need specifically to have Sakitama in my hand to make this a safe play. And for that reason, I actually cut this card. I just don't want to run it right now because I don't want to risk being in those kinds of situations. And that's actually where Dimax's video comes in because he plays against Exosister player, and I'll play the clip. Next game, we'll be going second against Exosister. Looks like they're on the Spirits, and they're going to start by normal summoning Aratama, which I imperm expecting that to win me the game, but they did draw the one out, which is the Saki Tama. They'll normal summon that and then go for Caspatel. Caspatel is going to search for them a copy of Martha. They'll Martha, I'll Ash, their deck is bad. They'll set Returnia and pass. Okay, yes, we have a seven card hand, but it's just because I wanted to make sure that the test hand opponent has access to Ash and Imperm. We will not be using either of these cards ourselves. Just act like they're not here. So copying what happened in the Dimex game, we activate our Martha. Our opponent is going to Ash that. Now... Um, this is a bit of a different situation. Your opponent may not necessarily negate the Stella. Uh, they may, but usually if you normal summon it and then activate it, that cues to your opponent that, oh, okay, you don't have anything else that you can do. Like, if I negate this, your normal summon's done, you can't extend further, right? And potentially you could just set the Armit, set the Returnia, and on your opponent's turn... You can tag into a Mikhailas, you can banish something, you can tag into Caspatel, lock down their graveyard, and then this would represent two banishes, and that would be okay, right? But we can do more than that. We can activate the Sakitama. You could go into Caspatel here, but I don't think that's worthwhile. You go into Mikhailas, and you activate Mikhailas effect. So here you can grab either Vadis or Carpe Diem. So if you go for uh, Vadis, right, you'd activate Vadis on the opponent's turn, usually in their draw phase after they draw or during their standby phase, to summon a Martha plus an Ellis from the deck. This would allow you to use Armint on your Ellis to go into whatever Exo Sister is relevant. Like once you realize what your opponent's on, you can be like, oh, okay, if you're on Goblin Rider, you have a bunch of grave oriented effects, revival things going on. I'm going to force you to have to play differently. You can't special summon things back, or more importantly, you can't activate these effects in the grave, right? You go for Asafil off of this. And then you would just have the Returnia set. So at that point, you can activate the Returnia. You get to banish a card from their graveyard just to keep them off of a piece. It will trigger the Martha that you special summoned off of Vadis, right? And then on top of that, on top of that, you could overlay these two Xyz that have served their purpose into a Magnifica while getting access to Jabrine, your fourth one, right? Like, just adding this one card, swapping it out for Aratama, completely changed the axis that deck was functioning on. Or maybe it didn't completely change the axis, but it gave it so much more flexibility right and this card is like yes it's something you can only activate on your opponent's turn but it's a very strong proactive tool that is one of the boons of it it helps you lean into the inherent strengths of locking down the opponent's graveyard in different ways that this deck has and then on the crack bag you're already sitting on a jabreen and a magnifica right if they can't remove them if they can't out them that's a 3600 body and it can attack twice. It has a non-targeting banish, so you would have potentially been able to deal with the Dark Knight Lancer. And then you have the Jabreen, which is a negate, or, well, use the negate already, but you can detach one. She would be, uh, what, 14, 
right? And if this did, like if you did make the Magnifica and you tag back into Makaila's, all right, you have a Martha in hand and you can search out another spell or trap, whether that be Pax, the Carpe Diva, I'm assuming you didn't do that, or another Returnia. Yep. Now coming back to the deck, I want to talk a bit about trying to compete at the highest level because uh, I think that at some point it it sparks a shift in how you're looking at things and approaching things. Now, I do want to preface this by saying I have never, 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 never gone to a regionals, a YCS, or like even a remote event for Yu-Gi-Oh! specifically. But I have play tested with people for these events, tried to get them prepped. Uh, I was also trying to, you know, get myself prepped. It's just my own personal circumstances regarding my life and whatnot led to me being unable to go to these events. And I do understand also that maybe whatever it is I'm saying here may be taken less seriously because I don't necessarily have the accolades to back up the things that I'm saying. But yeah, I'll, I'll just ask that you listen to what I have to say, uh, consider it, and then make your decision from there. So with Aratama, we already went over this. You don't necessarily want to run it, or at least I don't want to run it right now because you're presented with a situation where... If this is the card that you're using to start your plays, right, it, it's very good for that. You end up being kind of bottlenecked in terms of what extension pieces work with it, right? So if you play the Aratama and you don't specifically have Sakitama in hand, you're in a rough spot. Especially because Pax, even though it can potentially special summon one of your Exosister names, it can only do so if you have the paired name either on your field or in your graveyard. And if you can't make an Exosister body in the first place, even searching out Ellis would be kind of pointless because you wouldn't have an Exosister on field for her to be able to special summon herself. On the other hand, if you're running the three copies of Stella, you normal summon the Stella, the Stella gets negated, okay, you can extend with Ellis, you can extend with Armin, you can extend with Sakitama. You also have the capability of extending with Pax if you really need to, but you'd prefer to get something else off of Pax in most circumstances. Right. So like th that's one consideration. All right. Like this card, objectively speaking, isn't really a brick. But when you consider what happens in your average game, when you consider what's going on in the metagame right now, when you're considering what you're faced with, it's more of a issue. Right. Like in our previous format, I was actually running Forbidden Lance in this and in Scareclaw because there were so many board breakers and stuff that people were running that, oh, OK, if I'm like... I still run the risk of getting hit by Effect Veiler if people are on Effect Veiler, and some people were, but I could deal with Infinite Impermanence, and I also had other reasons to run Lance. It could help in the purely matchup, right? If I wanted to dodge a specific effect that it doesn't even necessarily have to be the Imperm, just other spell and trap effects, I could use that, and that was oftentimes that extra bit of insulation that was more worth running because it didn't just help this card, it helped pretty much anything I could potentially have on my board, and then on top of that, it had applications for disrupting the opponent. But now, Forbidden Lance doesn't necessarily have those defensive applications as much. Um, it's not impossible to use it in a kind of disruptive way, but it's much more difficult. Yeah, so that, that's how I ended up with this. And then you might be wondering, okay, well, why aren't you main decking the talents? And it's just that I got into situations where I would be going first, and let's say my opponent has the infinite impermanence, but they don't necessarily have a monster-based hand trap, then this card can sometimes be worse, right? Like, it's, it's a bit different if I'm going second and I'm, I'm, you know, I have six cards, right? So if I win game one, I go second. I've more than likely sided this in, potentially over the Sakitama. I feel a little bit more comfortable doing that because, all right, my opponent is a little bit more likely. My opponent would be considerably more likely to have a monster effect that can be used to interact with me. And therefore, you know, it would turn on the talents. I'd have the potential to force out a monster activation, even if they didn't necessarily have a hand trap, right? And I'd be able to get value. Like, realistically speaking, I probably wouldn't actually uh, take out three Sakitama. I'd probably change my siding pattern to something like this, because that way, I still have this as an extender, 
and this can be searched out but this lets me draw cards so like i got the hand fixing if i see this i can search something else uh if i don't see it but i see this i can search that out right but the important thing here i think is the types of considerations i'm having because these are considerations you want to have if you're playing pretty much anything like i was listening to i forget what the name of it is let me Heart of the Cast, the podcast that Farfa and Joshua Schmidt have. And and Pac was on the other day, and he just kind of talked through his reasoning for a couple of things. I think one thing that was mentioned is he went with the pure Snake Eye deck because a lot of the reason that the various fire decks are good is because of the Snake Eye cards in the first place. And he didn't want to have, I think he said he he didn't want to have his engine tapped to another engine. And just run the highest quality cars that he possibly could, right? So just just take that idea. In the macro scale, just looking at the format as a whole, what's the best thing that you could probably be running at any point in time? The Snake Eye stuff, right? Now, let's bring that down. For this deck, what are the best cards you could possibly be running? And a lot of the time, people would say Aratama, because Aratama gets you much further than Martha does. But... Running Aratama invites weaknesses that, at least in the current format, I don't think you can necessarily compensate for all that well. So it's a similar deal where I'm like, you know what, I just I just want to lean further into the Exosister stuff, but I'm fine with Saketama specifically because Saketama is just an extender that works regardless. I think that's all I have to say for now, and I do understand some of you would like to have gameplay footage to go along with these explanations. I don't want to put it in this video because I think I'm getting close to like 20 minutes or something like that now, but I'm hoping to go to locals this Saturday, and hopefully I can record my matches, and we can have some post-commentary over those, right? Additionally... I'm going to link three videos in the description. One is going to be Dimax's video. It's actually showing some cool stuff you can do with Goblin because there was an overlooked rank three little... Honestly, there's this barely even an archetype archetype that uh, has some pretty neat application with Goblin cards. Also, check the pinned comment of that video because there's something kind of important mentioned in it. And uh, what else? What else? What else? Oh, I'm also going to link MBT's Ash Blossom video. I did watch it before uh, finishing up this outro, I guess. And it, it does talk a bit about something that I think is a good consideration to have. The video is titled Murder Your Darlings. I, I, I believe he says whose quote it is at the start. And I know I've read it when I was in school, but I just don't remember. Um... But yeah, it kind of goes over that idea that, you know, we run Ash just because it's a thing that you do without necessarily critically evaluating it. The video goes beyond that, and I just think it's a good thing. Like, regardless of what level of play you're at, that that's that video covers some useful concepts. I, I highly suggest it. And then I'm also going to link the podcast in the description. Uh, again, I, I enjoyed it. I have to go for walks sometimes due to physical therapy and stuff. And I really enjoy being able to listen to card game podcasts and get other people's thoughts and insights regardless of like skill level and stuff and, and sometimes you find out some interesting things because hey may maybe we'll find out something about alternative fan-made formats one day and maybe one of those will get some big support because hey look at look at pokemon you got the gym leader challenge which i believe is a player created thing and now it's just consistently a side event <laughs> at official pokemon events so hey uh but yeah y'all have a good morning afternoon, evening, or night. Peace.